Good evening. Good evening. We welcome you to the first in our series of midweek Lenten services. We preach Christ crucified as the theme for this year, and we'll see in various ways from the epistles uh, the different ideas that are reflected there. Tonight, uh, Paul writes about the foolishness of the cross. If you look at your little bulletin insert type for this evening, you'll see on the, if you look at the first page, if you can tell which is the first page, there's a little <laughs> quiz towards the bottom. Just a very brief quiz about three people that were involved in Jesus' uh, passion. And uh, they play into this idea of the foolishness of the cross. So sometime you could look at that this evening and uh, see what you think in regards to who is who in regard to those questions. We'll begin our service this evening by singing our opening hymn. That'll be hymn number 420, Jesus I Will Ponder Now, stanzas one through four.
begin with an opening devotion. Grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The foolish wisdom of the cross that we preach. If God is an almighty God, is it possible that he can make a stone that he cannot lift? If nothing is impossible with an infinite God, how many angels can you make dance on the end of a pin? You may smile or laugh at those questions, but those are actual questions that have been asked over the centuries of time, particularly in the Middle Ages. Most of the time, I suppose, they were raised by skeptics of the faith. It seems that with such a question, a person might think that he could challenge God and perhaps overcome God with something that God could not really reconcile or bring about and perform. In the end, I suppose the individual was hoping to make God look foolish. He's made foolish by a seeming contradiction that he could never really do. For the believer, such seeming contradictions about God and faith, they're actually nothing new to us. We even have a name for them. We call them the mysteries of the faith, the things that are hidden to us that we do not completely understand. They're divine things that defy human reasoning. For the unbeliever, they seem like nonsense. You can actually add to the list, I think. Here's some of them. How can God be three persons and yet there only be one being. How can God, or Jesus really, be fully God and fully man at the same time? How can Jesus be born into time as the Lord over time, who has no beginning and no end? As true God in control of all things, who says he ne never slumbers nor sleeps, how is it that Jesus naps while he's in the back of the boat on the Sea of Galilee in a raging storm? Or finally, the one that is most directly connected with our Lenten experience this year. How can God not die since he's eternal and at the same time die on the cross? You know, as they sit in the classroom of the Holy Spirit, you and believers learn to be at peace with these and a hundred other types of contradictions that seem to be the case from the Bible. We accept them, not because we understand them by human reason, but because the Holy Spirit has enlightened our minds to receive them in faith. Faith is the evidence of things that are not seen, the writer to the Hebrews says. And we know that God's ways are beyond our ways. His thinking is superior to ours. Nothing is nonsense for him to accomplish. Indeed, it actually comforts and it strengthens us in our faith to know that God is infinite and that he surpasses all human understanding because then he is God. He is God that is above us and can help us then. This evening, we have the highest, one of the highest contradictions of all. Can God lift a burden that has been created by the creatures whom he has made? Well, that burden is sin. Is it possible for a holy God to bear the guilt and punishment for sin that his creatures have put upon him? Well, God found a way to solve that problem. And very simply, as you know, he solved that through the cross. To man's mind, though, the cross is utter foolishness. It is not the way to go. If you want to follow along in the reading this evening, you'll find that on that front page from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Paul writes about the foolish wisdom of the cross. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. 
Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. All right, so what can the cross do? Here is where worldly men see foolishness. Yet in reality, we find God's wisdom at work there. It's called the foolish wisdom of the cross by St. Paul. In your service outline this evening, that was that front page I mentioned before. There are three examples of this. There are the examples of Cephas, the example of King Herod, and then Pontius Pilate. And all of them were in direct contact with Jesus during his passion. Each in his way regarded Jesus or the things of Jesus as totally foolish. First there was Caiaphas. He was the high priest of the Jews. He thought that he knew better than God what kind of a Messiah his people needed. When he confronted or was confronted with Jesus, Caiaphas could not allow the possibility that Jesus was the one whom God had promised to send to help his people because Caiaphas had no need for a savior from sin. He was only looking for survival for his nation, the Jews, from the Roman Empire. And when it seemed to him that Jesus was going to complicate that and raise a problem for them among the Romans, he declared, it is better that one man should die than that the people should perish. See, he was determined to get rid of Jesus before Jesus caused a problem, as Caiaphas saw it. Rather than listening to God, Caiaphas knew what was best. Of worldly people who think along those lines, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Okay, then there was Herod, King Herod. He demanded that Jesus would perform a sign for him to prove that he was God. He also wanted Jesus to entertain him with something spectacular. When Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, had sent Jesus on to Herod, after he learned that Jesus was from Herod's jurisdiction, the Bible says that Herod was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about Jesus, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. So when Jesus refused and did not speak and did not entertain Herod, Herod dressed Jesus in an elegant robe, and then he ridiculed and he mocked him. Here it is an example of those who say, show me, and I'll believe it. He's also like people who want religion to entertain them. Of worldly people who desire such things, God says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, and none will be given to them. Then Paul writes in our text, Jews demand miraculous signs, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews. Well, finally, there's Pontius Pilate. He looked for wisdom about the truth, but he scoffed when Jesus spoke the truth to him. The truth Jesus spoke was very simple. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
But Pilate could not accept that Jesus was the only way to God. And he's certainly not through death by what he considered the worst of all deaths, the Roman death of crucifixion on a cross. What kind of a wisdom is that to go that way, Pilate would think? Of worldly-minded people who think the way that Pilate writes, Paul says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? So you have all three of these who are involved in Jesus' passion. They all thought that they knew more than God did. Do we sometimes think the same way when it's hard for us to accept God's ways in our lives? But God's wisdom is not something that can be understood from a worldly point of view. Just consider once the matter of forgiveness and salvation. If you can really understand that as a human, thinking human ways. If you could stand outside of your faith, you have to stand outside of your faith completely for just a moment. Impossible, I realize. But if you could do that, if you could stand outside of your faith for just a moment and adopt a worldly approach to things, like any of these three men, the message of the cross seems to be quite foolish, even ridiculous to our way of thinking. How is it that a man whose arms and legs are stretched out on a wooden cross and nailed there by dying is going to bring you forgiveness of all of your sins and open the door of heaven so that you have eternal life? In a worldly point of view, that makes no sense. In fact, it's impossible. To some, it's distasteful. It's disgusting. It's foolishness. Yet in God's world, it is the means and the only means by which he could bring about our salvation. And through faith in its preaching, one is saved. For there at the cross, the ultimate mystery of God himself is actually satisfied. God describes himself on the one hand as the compassionate and merciful God, slow to anger and forgiving all wickedness, rebellion, and sin. But that's not all. He continues right after that by saying that he will not leave the guilty go unpunished, that he will punish the children and their children for the sins of the fathers unto the third and the fourth generation. So on the one hand, he is the compassionate and the forgiving God, forgiving all wickedness and rebellion and sin, but he is equally, on the other hand, the just and the righteous God who will not put up with that. Therefore, he has no choice but to punish Caiaphas' sin, Herod's sin, Pilate's sin, and then yours and mine. He has to punish it. And here is where worldly thinking trips all of the time. God is perfectly merciful, perfectly forgiving of every sin, and at the same time, he is perfectly just and punishing every sin. He must do both at the same time. That's an irreconcilable contradiction too big for the human mind to accept completely on its own. Remember the question, can the almighty God create a stone that he could not even lift? Well, this is even worse. Can God punish all sin and every sinner for the wrongs of all time and at the same time forgive all sin and save every sinner from just condemnation for what they have done? To human thinking, that's impossible. But these two contradictory things are reconciled at the cross of Jesus because there God laid all the punishment for sin upon his only innocent son who alone could bear them and carry them for all, enduring their consequences. His solution was the only one that could work and it brings us in the end joy. So Paul writes, 
we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, people who demand a sign, and foolishness to Gentiles, people who question God's truth and think that they are wiser than he is, but to those whom God has called, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. See, it's only the cross of Christ that can lift us. Why? Because there, the perfect Son of God, who is in very nature God, who is God in himself, was crucified in your place. And in that, God's requirement was met. It's the only way that it could be accomplished through him. This message of the cross may be foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who believe, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God unto salvation. So it is that we preach Christ crucified, and none other for our life in him exists now and forever. God always grant us that faith for Jesus' sake. Amen. We continue with the singing of our next hymn, 797, I Know My Faith is Founded.
please rise. And if you would turn to page 278 in the front of your hymnal, we'll utilize the same uh, service that we used on this past Sunday, the corporate confession and absolution as we enter this Lenten season. So page 278. And we ask you to speak the responses in the bold print. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may love you and praise your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We continue with the psalm for this evening. You'll find that as Psalm 51 in the front part of the hymnal. This evening we'll speak the psalm instead of singing it. Psalm 51. We'll begin with the refrain. We'll join together in saying it. Then read through the psalm. And we won't use the refrain again until the very end. So begin with the refrain, read through the whole psalm, the glory be to the Father, and then close with the refrain. If you would join with me. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. The congregation may be seated. And as our custom is during the Lenten season, we read always a portion of the Passion history as it is compiled from the four Gospels during these midweek Lenten services. This first lesson for this evening is entitled, Jesus' Readiness to Suffer and to Die. The festival of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. Jesus said to his disciples, you know that after two days it will be the Passover, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. It was he who had said, it is better that one man should die than that the people should perish. They plotted together how to arrest Jesus in some deceitful way and kill him. But they said, not during the festival, or else there might be a riot among the people. Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He went away and spoke with the chief priests and officers of the temple guard about how he could betray Jesus to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. He promised to do it and was looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them away from the crowd. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city. And there a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house that the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. They went and found things just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table with the 12 apostles. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. A dispute arose among the disciples about which of them was considered to be greatest. But he told them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not to be that way with you. Instead, let the greatest among you become like the least, and the one who leads like the one who serves. For who is greater? One who reclines at the table or one who serves? Isn't it the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have remained with me in my trials. I am going to grant a kingdom to you, just as my Father granted to me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved those who were his own in the world, he loved them to the end. By the time the supper took place, the devil had already put the idea into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. He got up from the supper and laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, You do not understand what I am doing now, but later you will understand. Peter told him, You will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Lord, not just my feet, Simon Peter replied, but also my hands and my head. Jesus told him, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, but his body is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Indeed, he knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garment, he reclined at the table again. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, because I am. Now, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Yes, I have given you an example so that you also would do just as I have done for you. Amen, amen, I tell you. A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. He took a cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So far, the reading of the Passion history for this evening. And we continue in our service with the singing of our next hymn in preparation for communion. Hymn number 657, Baptismal Waters. 657. <laughs>
And now we return to page 279 in the confessional service. Page 279 in the front of the hymnal. Again, we ask the congregation to speak the responses in the bold print. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. In what I have done and left undone, I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved others as you command. For this I deserve your punishment now and forever. I am sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy. And we take a moment of silence to reflect on those words. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins. Release me from my guilt. Grant me your Holy Spirit to amend my sinful life. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. In the name and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us, has reconciled us to God, and has promised us the power to forgive and love one another. Relying on his promise, therefore, be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. Let us pray. God, our Father, by the sacrifice of your Son, you reconciled the world to yourself. We thank you for the precious gift of forgiveness. Refresh us with the joy of our salvation, that we may walk in the way of peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Renew our minds and wills, that daily we may speak your word of peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we join together in the prayer that the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. So we now invite you to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. I think you can all come up at one time. Uh, I'm not even sure that you have to set the... Uh, Table in the middle, yes. <laughs> Whatever that table in the middle is called. The table in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Maybe why don't you just remain standing for this evening? We'll do this all together. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Given into death for your sins.
take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood and given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. We continue in the service on page 281 with the prayer for peace and then the blessing. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Christ Jesus has set you free. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. We close our service this evening with the last hymn, hymn number 789, All Praise to Thee, My God, This Night. Mm -hmm. 